David, um, I can't hear you. I think you, you're unmuted. Uh, you're, yes. Okay, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this seminar. I'm sorry that I was unmuted. I was muted. So I welcome you all to this joint seminar between um, Reykjavik University and the Energy Institute at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. It's the second international seminar on sustainable development. Um, it's a joint initiative between the two universities. And the reason behind it is because Austria and Iceland have both very ambitious climate action policies. Um, the Icelandic government stated that they would like to become carbon neutral or climate neutral by 2040. And the Austrian government just passed the legislation to um, decarbonize the energy sector and become entirely renewable by 2030. Which is in which is in less in almost seven years, so it's a very ambitious, very ambitious policies. These policies require a joint effort from industries, universities, and politics, and I believe that such a seminar could be a first step to creating these synergies. <clears throat> we have four. The, the seminar is divided in two parts. Today we will focus on projects ongoing in Austria and from my colleagues at the Johannes Kepler University. And tomorrow we will focus on projects in Iceland. So you're welcome to join both days. And um, it's my pleasure to open the seminar for today. I, I'm delighted to introduce four, five keynote speakers with projects that are ongoing in Iceland. And we will start with the first speaker, Johannes Lindorfer. He will talk about decarbonizing the industry in Linz. Johannes, are you here? Yes, I'm here. We're warm hello. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share your screen. We see your screen. Perfect. I'm just switching. So it basically should work now, right? We can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the nice introduction. So where well, hello everybody. My name is Johannes Lindofer. I'm working for the Energy Institute as a as a project manager and senior researcher. And uh, well, the the topic for the next 30 minutes is decarbonizing the industry, but I would like to spotlight on options how to do this and one option is to switch to renewable gas supplies in the various industries and there is a lot of let's say discussion and a lot of projects that we're dealing with are targeting this fuel substitution and switch towards uh, renewables and well we are having a lot of projects on the future uh, of gas supply and biomethane SNG renewable hydrogen and all the various uh, derivatives out of it are one option. So that is the main topic of my talk. And well, I will kind I will shortly introduce the main characteristics of these technical options uh, that we are uh, normally investigating and discuss the different concepts uh, quite broadly. So it's more like, like a, a synergistic uh, view of a lot of projects that we're doing in the field and one key aspect is always on, okay, how are the costs? And that's that's uh, also a topic that I wanna, wanna discuss. And for sure, conclusions are always necessary. As David introduced, it is um, really decarbonizing is the hot topic at the moment. And it's not really about whether if, if it's going to happen, it's more on when it's going to happen. and. In the European Union, we have these new announcements on 35% uh, greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 and uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So the countries uh, Austria and Iceland, we've heard, are even more ambitious on that. And But on the other hand, we have quite strong fluctuations also in the energy prices. Uh, for example, here, just a screenshot on the spot market prices of Central Europe for natural gas. And we have really faced, or the industry here locally, have faced a, 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 a huge up and down in the prices. And especially in the last three months, they're real up. So we have seen about three times as high natural gas prices on the spot market 
uh, in in the last in last October uh, here in October, uh, which we haven't seen so far for years when we are in the business. Well, what is the framework on these on these topics? I want to kind of go also a bit outside uh, of the of the scope here because here you see a list of scenarios that are dealing with. Um, let's say the transition of the European energy systems uh, and all those scenarios with the time frame 2030 that are on here in the list are reaching the targeted CO2 reduction of the 55% basically. What is the intention here is really to, to, to do this via strong energy consumption reductions so really energy efficiency energy efficiency should be the game changer till 2030 when we look further what about 2050 where we are targeting basically the full decarbonization of the energy system uh, and the emission reductions uh, towards 90 percent we see that basically the fossils down here mainly disappear and are substituted via a lot of diverse renewables, uh, but also a lot of biomass is in those scenarios in there. So there is an indication that gas, the natural gas, the purple down there, uh, will play a minor role in this full transition scenarios and especially biomass and other renewables will strongly increase. And that's why I'm going to focus on three technologies in that field. So fermentation processes, so classical anaerobic digestion, a chemical processes towards producing biomethane from the, you know, all the materials that are, that are quite wet and all the biogenic waste you can process towards that. The thermochemical processes, uh, gasification, uh, especially is targeting really the feedstock with a high lignin content. All of that goes into those routes uh, in, in most of the scenarios and also in, in practical applications. The third route, the less mature, is on the electrochemical power to gas process. So producing hydrogen from especially fluctuating renewable electricity uh, sources. A lot of in, in a lot of our projects, we're dealing with, with very diverse questions. In, uh, related to the relevance of these technologies. So which process chains are, uh, are the most important ones? Which components do we need there? What are the mass and energy balances? And what are also the efficiencies of the technology? Because we have a scarce uh, availability of resources and we wanna transfer it to the maximum energy output for the system. It's always also a question in the state of development. So if the technology is mature, it's less um, uh, less secure that it's going to survive also the next 10 years and be scalable. So upscaling, because we really need uh, a lot of renewable energy and not just minor proportions. And then also, as I said already, the CAPEX, the capital expenditures, so what you have to pay for the specific installation and then also what you need for running the installation, the OPEX, the operational expenditures are combined to so-called levelized cost of energy to compare the different pathways uh, within each other. Efficiency, as I said, is also for the renewables very, very relevant because we cannot do, uh, we, we have a very limited resource potential also on that side. And that brings me to the, to the more dive into the technologies themselves. So biochemical SNG production. Here are illustrated uh, three diagrams uh, that give a really decent overview on what's on at the moment in Europe on that field. So what are the types of plants that are out there uh, to produce biomethane? What is the gas processing technology? So coming from a raw gas concentration of 60% methane towards, let's say 100% methane to really be able to one-to-one -one substitute natural gas with that. And for sure, we need to transport uh, the new gases and their uh, grid connection is quite nice. So at the moment we have 700, 730, sorry, 730 biomethane upgrading plants operational in Europe. 
approximately 5,200 are built each year. So there is still some sort of a ramp up of the technology, but it's a bit slowed down. And well, 26 terawatt hours of biomethane seems to be a lot, but for example, the Austrian target is to have five terawatt hours already uh, in the grid uh, in the next, yeah, till 2030. So 26 at the moment for whole Europe is not a lot. What are the problematic uh, things about uh, biomethane production, biogas, anaerobic digestion? It's in, in the typical biogas composition. So I don't want to stress too much the specific numbers, but you have certain components like hydrogen sulfur in a very broad range uh, of concentrations and all the upgrading technologies need to perfectly deal uh, with especially the, the components and the fluctuations and the broad range that can appear in the product gases. All in all, when we compare or when we look at the biogas technology, I would say it's a really mature technology. First implementations are 30 years old. The technology is running and it has the highest TRL in all the biogenic or green gas options. What is still in the field of research is a lot in terms of, okay, uh, how can we combine different substrates in a perfect technological setups together, accessing residues with a high lignocellulosic content like straws and so on, they need to be pre-processed uh, to be anaerobically digested. I'm switching to the next technology, thermochemical SNG production. We have quite a lot of uh, projects in history, especially also in Austria. Here you see a picture of the biogas plant in Gussen, which recently moved from a small village um, in Burgenland, um, uh, yeah, south, uh, southeast Austria, to Vienna, where it's more central. And there it's also be will be adapted this plant there. Uh, what is done when when you when you um, when you gasify a, a certain feedstock, normally wood chips, but also recently uh, municipal solid waste fraction and so on, you're building a synthesis gas via an oxidizing agent, which is normally steam or, uh, uh, or oxygen. And this synthesis gas has a lot of hydrogen in it and CO2. So both components contribute to the heating value and the off gas is uh, CO2. And with that synthesis gas, you can basically transfer it uh, via water gas shift reactions towards a maximum uh, methane content. But you also can use uh, the hydrogen in there. There are a lot of different types of gasifiers. Uh, I don't want to go into detail. But here again, the most uh, relevant topics in first, especially heavy metal components and tar components in uh, in fly ashes and in the slags so that we really get rid of all those uh, components there. The technology comes basically from, from China and South Africa where they uh, initially uh, initially invented or, or produced coal to SNG plants uh, due to a lack of natural gas uh, resources. And at the moment we are, I would say at the TRL four to seven, so it's still, a lot of research, but some plants are already operational in a large industrial scale. What is, uh, what is done there in terms of technological development, as I said, the tar reduction. So you really need to have a very clean gas to not uh, jeopardize your synthesis options, your technical synthesis options towards uh, the SNG. So the catalyst, uh, poisoning catalyst stability is the biggest research field, I would say. And it's kind of a quite a big process. You need gasification, gas cleaning, uh, synthesis, uh, and that's kind of costly quite clearly, especially in the investment. So we need to kind of decrease the cost there. If you ever look for past installations in the field, I highly recommend uh, a database which is issued by the ER Bioenergy, where we also cooperate uh, on on this field with with this uh, expert level group. Uh, you find it on the web, and there you have basically most of uh, the activities in there with some specific data. 
I switched to the next technology, electrochemical SNG production. So it's all about electrolyzers. So turning water uh, with uh, excess power or electricity towards uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, here we have a lot of different technology options or the, basically the characteristics of the three predominant ones are in this table. And I would sum up that at the moment, it's really a run on how to get uh, the maximum current density and also the maximum uh, efficiency towards hydrogen uh, into play for the different technologies. There we have the lowest TRL for all the SNG production options for the natural gas production of substitutes. Well, but uh, there is then also still the maximum increase possible in TRL. So there is some demand in R&D, but uh, well, uh, that, that also makes, makes a good proposition for the future on that field. And at the moment, it's really, the idea to, to install and run multi megawatt plants all over Europe in order to reduce uh, the manufacturing costs and the operation, operational costs. For that purpose, there is also uh, an, an project database available. It's, uh, uh, it's issued by, uh, by the group of EA Hyd Hydrogen. You find uh, the project's database here, the link to it. And it's also relatively comprehensive. In my point of view, you have a strong categorization of the different projects in terms of, okay, what are the end use products? What are the technologies implemented there? And you also have uh, a, a very research oriented projects in there, for example, for hydrogen production from biomass. And it's quite nicely comprehensively uh, put it together for any search purposes. Coming to this comparative approach that we very often do to, to guide, let's say industry, but also uh, policies towards optimal solutions. And here is just a chart and a comparison of the efficiencies of the different technologies uh, that, that we have there. And I just want to say that it's quite, quite, um, yeah, it, it can be quite complex to compare the various technologies uh, within uh, the same system boundary. Because, for example, if we know anaerobic digestion, you put in some some uh, some sewage sludge and and produce SNG, and for the electrochemical pathway, you put in highly valuable, highly exergetic electricity, and you produce some SNG, how this then kind of can be one-to-one -one comparative. In terms of the efficiency, when we put all the numbers together that we have in, in the various databases, it's quite... Uh, uh, the picture is like that, that at the moment, the thermochemical pathways uh, seems to be, seems to provide the highest efficiencies, um, followed by the electrochemical and the biological pathways. Well, the biological pathways, they are established at a commercial scale. The te thermochemical are still evolving and the electrochemical are at the lowest uh, TRL stages. So here also, uh, the targets in terms of the, the efficiency of let's say 80% are not really shown in practical operations in a lot of uh, sites, but these are the targets. So coming to decide efficiency, we it's quite important for an industry player to invest in such a technology. What about the costs? That that is quite clear, and so we are modeling a lot in terms of a levelized cost of energy learning curve so how are the costs decreasing if i increase uh, the scale if i put a lot of those facilities into place and when we look at the austrian uh, prognosis more or less in a quantity qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, you see here the estimate of specific production costs related to the potentials and the pathways that we're looking at. For sure, it's quite a long time scale. If we talk towards 2050, 
but we see that we expect if there are significant installations of electrolyzers in Austria, then we anticipate quite a strong decrease in the specific production costs in Eurocent per kilowatt hour. Still, biomethane pathways are uh, at the moment uh, the cheapest one, but we don't expect such a strong decrease because the technology is already quite mature. You have already a lot of plants and the learning curves, so the decrease of the costs uh, might be lower and, and uh, less implementable. So we end up with basically the same cost structures for the gasification technology. The cost situation seems to be a bit higher uh, in terms of all the technical equipment that you need for that technology. We also did then comparative studies in terms of what are the specific costs and what are uh, what is the potential of the technology in terms of the feedstock. And this is uh, introduced into such diagrams that we call some sort of a merit order for renewable gases. So what is the cheapest and what is the most expensive uh, and, and what are uh, what is the potential in terms of terawatt hours. When we go a bit further into detail of those models, uh, we see that it is also very important to look at uh, the full load hours of uh, the specific uh, technologies in operation, especially for the power to gas plant. And we have, in our studies, we have found some sort of optimal operation situations uh, for power to gas plant, plants in terms of that we look, okay, uh, for low operational hours, we have a strong impact of the investment because it's not running uh, a lot of hours, then the, these few hours, these few uh, kilowatt and megawatt that come out of the plant in terms of uh, uh, SNG need to refinance all the investment. And if we then kind of have higher uh, full load hours, then the investment can be refinanced more easily. But on the other hand, there is a contradictory trend because if we have higher full load hours, we also uh, end up with higher electricity input prices. So that some sort of needs to be optimized from both directions. And that is one on topic that we're dealing with. And here are other graphs on that that show some sort of trends where we, where we take in uh, electricity price uh, projections uh, for Central Europe for 2020, we have the numbers, but for 2030 and 2050, uh, those are project projections and how the specific production costs may evolve on that side. So all in all, I'm already summing up uh, in terms of providing a table, where are the specific investment costs in which range and what are the average production costs of uh, the natural gas uh, substitutes. <clears throat> for sure, it is still, let's say three times as high as we see it for the natural gas at the moment. Uh, yeah, prices of CO2 and also, as I said, uh, the prices for natural gas are, are increasing uh, and especially more fluctuating in the last months. Um, summary on the cost for the biochemical pathway, thermochemical pathway and electrochemical pathway, quite outstanding is the bandwidth, especially for those technologies who are less mature. So. It needs to be very specifically assessed what is the best uh, implementation uh, for the specific uh, technology. That's quite clear. And what is the outlook on that? If we then probably have installed a lot of those natural gas substitute producing facilities from the various feedstocks, it is the idea of the gas grid operators in Europe to generate some sort of uh, a so-called hydrogen backbone. So to switch um, from the natural, from the single natural gas supply towards uh, hydrogen and synthetic natural gas supply, starting with some sort of hubs for, uh, for, uh, for hydrogen use and then 
10 years afterwards. So this would be then the picture for 2040. Uh, it is targeted to have approximately 23,000 kilometers all over Europe with, uh, with uh, hydrogen pipelines. And 75% of it should be uh, transformed natural gas pipelines towards uh, hydrogen uh, hydrogen resistance so that you can also transport in the natural gas pipelines the, hyd the hydrogen and 25% are the new dedicated specific pipelines. And Austria is here. It has been or is a strong natural gas hub in Europe. So it's quite uh, quite clear or it can be assumed that also uh, hydrogen that it also can play a role with with the transition towards net, uh, synthetic natural gases and hydrogen. What are the challenges? So for sure for the biomethane plants it's the image biogas because well biogas is smelly and I don't want it in my backyard and so on. So they need some sort of evolve a really cooperative atmosphere with between the actors of the waste management, which is uh, the main potential feedstock that still can be accessed. And also the closing of the material and nutrient cycle uh, for all those technologies uh, is, is really relevant. The, bio, uh, the biomass gasification plants, well, we really need huge plants and there you need a lot of transport. So this needs to be perfectly uh, set it up. Otherwise you will end up with a lot of truck transport in terms of bringing the biomass in. And uh, the power to gas plant really needs a low cost renewable electricity supply. To run it with, uh, uh, with fossil based electricity is uh, no way in terms of emission savings and and benefits uh, for, for a system transition. So at the moment, the political agenda is definitely on the hydrogen topic, but still biogenic hydrogen, synthetic methane or biomethane are relevant technologies. We definitely will not forget them and keep them in mind in all our uh, investigations and assessments. And everything goes towards industry transition. So we see less uh, gas in mobility based options uh, in the long run and also in the heating market. So the industry really desperately needs those renewable gases for uh, their transition. And I don't want to stress too much these conclusions because I'm already over time a bit, right? What is the time? Yeah. So that, slightly over time, but yeah, I think so that's why I'm quite, uh, quite finished already here. So to keep that or to bring this into play and really into, uh, into the run, it's quite clear that we need strengthening the European emission trading scheme and need higher CO2 certificate prices on that to foster and uh, uh, foster and support the implementation of all the technologies that I'm that I was talking about that is quite clear and for sure the investment cycles are quite long so already now if there is a switch or if there is a change in the industry installations um, it is quite uh, required that we are looking all on the renewable options and that is that is basically our daily business in that field, some publications, scientific publications on the topic recently, the last two years on that side. And with that, I thanks a lot. That was it in a rush. I hope uh, this was valuable for you on the view of renewable gases, Austria and Europe wide. Thanks. Thank you, Johannes Lindorfer. Um, I think we can give Johannes a big virtual applause. Um, and I would like to ask the second speaker, Simon Moser, Dr. Simon Moser, also from the Energy Institute to prepare his presentations. Maybe we have quite time for a short question. If anyone has a short question, then please feel free to do so now while um, Simon, the second speaker is preparing the presentation. Okay, then there is no, um, 
a question maybe, Johannes, a very short question. So um, if, if I'm not mistaken already now, you can um, inject 10% of hydrogen into the natural gas grid, is that correct? Yes, for Austria, that is correct. And also for Germany and uh, well, there has been some kind of a uh, lot of discussion about that, whether the, the gas system is, a, uh, is available for that and is really prepared for that. And uh, when, when we started our projects, there was this limit of, of four volume percent and it basically changed. And this is part of, of this transition that we see. Yeah. Yes. So thank you, Johannes. I see there's a question if you if the slides could be made available to uh, the audience. I think the, the the lectures will be recorded, so I think the video will be available and perhaps the slides as well. I'll get back to you on this later. But for now, we will give Simon Moser the floor um, on the synergies um, on industrial heat and industrial symbi symbiosis. So thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Simon Bosa, and I am a project manager and key scientist uh, here at uh, Energy Institute in Linz. Um, I am not a technician. I am uh, an economist, and so I deal with uh, the industrial process heat uh, from another perspective, which means uh, looking at the process heat, looking at uh, the waste heat and district heating uh, from a systemic, uh, economic, and from an organizational perspective. Um, also, uh, within uh, the International Energy Agency's uh, Technology Collaboration Program on Industry, uh, I also have the opportunity to uh, currently be the task manager on the topic of industrial symbiosis. Okay, and uh, here is some kind of uh, introductory presentation, uh, giving some background, giving some information about the projects uh, that we have done in this area and uh, what our conclusions have been so far, because definitely there is much to do on this topic. Just some background uh, slide, which I always like to show. Um, we have done an um, evaluation for Austria. What does it mean to switch to 100% renewables? And uh, today we already use uh, one third of uh, the energy is already coming from renewable energy sources. Um, and what we see is that there is the potential if we use all the potential of renewable uh, energy sources available in Austria. Um, this is not enough uh, to satisfy the current demand. So probably we will need to import uh, the same as today, uh, but just to realize uh, that definitely energy efficiency is important, uh, especially if other countries have the same problem and imports are not so cheap. So energy efficiency is not uh, something uh, else, a substitute to renewable energy sources, but definitely more than that, it is uh, something that uh, goes hand in hand. It is a synergy to uh, provide cost-effective renewables. That's the one thing, but uh, definitely there is a second uh, thing. If you look at uh, the sources that are available, today we have uh, fossil fuels, more or less as much as we want. And uh, of course, uh, fossil fuels have a high level of exergy. You can um, very good burn them and uh, produce exergy from that. And if we look at uh, the future energy sources, which we have evaluated uh, to be available in Austria, we see that many of them like geothermal, solar thermal are uh, very low exergy. So, uh, Exergy is even more scarce than renewables are, and that demands for the right allocation of these energy sources. Johannes has said that before, uh, hydrogen, for example, or renewable gases, uh, we need them where uh, the, the alternatives are not as present, uh, like for industrial uses.
coming back to the topic of heat, uh, this is a very uh, simplified presentation. Uh, and it simply shows how we use energy today, like when we have uh, gas, for example, for industrial heating, for residential heating. Um, we need uh, energy at temperature levels like 90 degrees in houses. Uh, maybe some industries uh, need a 130 degrees, 300 degrees, uh, but also, of course, 800 degrees. And depending on the process, uh, the residual temperatures are as high as 300, 500, even 600 degrees. I've heard the last week uh, are available uh, after the furnace. And uh, if we want to use have an exergy orientation and uh, really used it in an optimal way, we should use one unit of primary energy as often as possible. So we should have a cascading use of the heat. Uh, this, so to say, simply means uh, to rearrange uh, what we uh, saw on the previous slide and then use the temperatures as they are available, available uh, for the next purpose. Um, in a usual meaning, or also something that is already very common, uh, that means, for example, to use industrial waste heat for district heating, just to heat homes and for domestic hot water. But ideally, so if the industry has uh, waste heat temperatures uh, at a higher level, uh, they should again be used maybe for another industry before the residual heat is then again passed on to the households. So this cascading, of course, is something uh, that is very simply said from a technical perspective, okay, let's uh, rearrange according to temperatures. But on the other hand, uh, it means a lot of uh, pipeline building, it means a lot of costs, and it means symbiosis. There are different players who have to work together and. Definitely, there is much potential in addressing this topic, but definitely there are also some major problems to do that. And these are some of those that I want to address. Everything, everywhere there is a start and the starting point means that I have to have an idea about it. And uh, industrial symbiosis definitely offers untapped advantages but it means a cooperation of uh, more than one player. That's the least definition, so to say, of industrial symbiosis. Other definitions say it are uh, three or more. And uh, it means a different uh, types of actors which you have to cooperate. Often they have no clue about the core business of the others. And uh, that means that we have uh, to increase the knowledge about neighboring companies, about neighboring district heating networks, uh, the processes, also the frameworks that uh, would enable uh, such industrial symbiosis. So what we see is uh, starting from this information topic, uh, the implementation of industrial symbiosis is a process. Um, on the first hand, there is a general interest, and we currently see in a project that uh, also the company strategy making uh, the employees, staff aware of uh, industrial symbiosis topics, just look outside uh, the company borders, uh, can increase a lot. And uh, then this really seeking for uh, cooperation and investigating which are the topics that I can cooperate with with my neighboring company? Is it resources? Is it waste heat? Um, th these data, this knowledge has to be uh, derived. And on the other hand, it's not only the knowledge about uh, uh, the other companies, but also it's the knowledge about the technologies. So whenever you have no idea about uh, heat pumps, heat exchangers, or something like that, uh, there will not uh, come up a cooperation and uh, a simple uh, supply from the major supplier lines, so to say, from the, from the grids and also uh, 
a simple disposal, maybe to the waste uh, incineration or um, just blow into the air the waste heat. And of course, in the final end, uh, after a lot of negotiations, uh, hopefully the energy cooperation and the industrial symbiosis is derived. So we have looked uh, at the situation, uh, how can we enforce or at least support uh, the creation of industrial symbiosis. And uh, we have looked at the barriers uh, which are to be overcome and uh, tried to have an as complete list as possible uh, for the barriers to energy cooperation, so to say industrial symbiosis with a focus on energy. And uh, we identified 100 barriers. This is uh, not an uh, incidental number, so this is just uh, by chance that it are 100. And um, we see that uh, they can be categorized in many different ways. They can uh, be uh, categorized uh, to the discipline, they can be categorized to the origin, is it internal, is it external, and also to the stage of implementation uh, as shown before. What do we see from that? Uh, there are so many barriers, and uh, but what we see is that many technical and economic barriers are the same for single company measures and for industrial symbiosis slash energy cooperation. In other words, uh, whenever you are aware of the potential and want uh, to realize that, uh, the technologies to recover the energy, to transport it in pipelines and to reuse it in another process uh, that do not depend on company borders. That's uh, just not something technical, but more or less something legal. And uh, if the distances are not too long, it does not even uh, incur uh, higher economic costs. So what is the difference in the barriers between single company measures and uh, measures uh, taken by uh, more than one company? It are, uh, as indicated before, information barriers, but it are also social barriers and contractual barriers, like the complexity of uh, having a contract. Uh, there is not a simple plug and play solution uh, when two companies um, talk to each other and want to realize such a project, but they have to discuss on technical potential guarantees, they have to discuss on prices, on temperature levels, on profiles, on backup systems, etc. And uh, so as a consequence, uh, there is no simple solution with regard to policy instruments. Uh, it is not only funding, it is not only awareness raising, uh, but it is a combination of all these. Uh, just so that it is said, uh, there have been a lot of recent papers uh, which highlight the importance of local governments and local authorities in order to uh, bring forward uh, industrial symbiosis. Uh, local governments can really have a high impact on the um, situation on the perspective of the companies uh, to really uh, seek the potentials for cooperation. Very often, uh, one thing that we hear is, uh, but we cannot feed it into the district heating network because uh, there is a supplier, a district heating network supplier, and we cannot simply access uh, this district heating network. Um, we see that uh, district heating networks are more or less often or always owned uh, by some kind of legal entity, a company, so to say, and uh, the network belongs to this company. And uh, so definitely there is some asset uh, where you have to negotiate. With. It's not as simple as uh, connecting to uh, the electricity grid or the gas grid, but on the other hand, whenever it's economically feasible, we have seen then it should be possible. Yes, uh, so in the end, there are uh, little legal provisions on feeding wasted into district heating networks, um, which is probably due to the case specificity and uh, the local nature of district heating networks. And the Renewable Energy Directive uh, intended to 
uh, have more demanding framework, but what we saw is that still it is simple negotiation, complex negotiation, uh, which must be done in order to um, feed heat into the district heating network. And so the next question is, uh, when I see what uh, the heat costs for me as a district heating uh, consumer, uh, I would very quickly get the idea uh, that it is the same uh, price the whole year around and uh, that it is rather high. Um, and then you, you might have the idea, or we have often heard of the idea that uh, it is rather simple and uh, that if waste heat is fed into the district heating network, uh, this customer price is the amount of remuneration a company, a waste heat providing company would get. And that's not true because, of course, uh, there are uh, some surplus margins. Uh, there are, of course, uh, most important uh, costs for the network itself and uh, only the least costs in district heating networks are uh, the generation. But any feed in, feed in of uh, waste heat, also uh, the same for uh, other heat sources like geothermal or solar thermal, um, have to compete with the marginal costs of the current generation because we still need the current generation as a backup system. It's still there. And uh, whenever, uh, as business administration uh, theory says, whenever you want um, to substitute a current uh, plant, you need to cope uh, to, sorry, uh, to compete with the marginal costs um, and not with the total costs. So they are essential, but they are not known to the public because uh, they are information, private information of the um, of the district heating company. And so in uh, one project, we redesigned uh, this heat merit order of uh, district heating networks in order to allow to evaluate the value of the waste heat that potentially could be fed in. Based on this heat merit order, which changes uh, fifth, every 50 minutes uh, due to the impact of the electricity sector, we can recalculate uh, what the maximum investment amount is to feed in uh, the waste heat of industry. And what we saw afterwards uh, is that we can also use it, uh, for example, for uh, seasonal heat storage or uh, industrial heat storage where we see uh, that, um, yes, that the, the, how much uh, the investment can be uh, for such a heat storage. Uh, of, course, of course, the prerequisites are uh, that there is a low cost source, which is the industrial waste heat, especially in summer. And on the other hand, there is a high cost benchmark, which are the uh, gas only boilers in winter. And uh, we have tested this uh, or analyzed this for an 80 gigawatt hour um, seasonal heat storage. This is approximately the size of a football stadium, which we which you uh, put there as a uh, concrete uh, as a concrete cylinder and uh, fill it with hot water. And uh, the one problem definitely is that there, in general, if you really mean it like you say seasonal heat storage it's one cycle per year you fill it and you empty it in the winter um, but we see that uh, ideally uh, the better dispatch also of the chp plants uh, is very crucial for the economics and we see that it on the at least on the edge of profitability also with uh, low current gas prices without co2 so again uh, supporting uh, what Johannes said, uh, these technologies will become available when CO2 prices are higher. The same is true uh, for industries. Uh, here we have tested industrial heat storages um, and looked at uh, their uh, characteristics by type, like um, what kind of material is used, uh, etc. And 
uh, have analyzed uh, what their potential maximum costs is uh, so that they can be uh, used uh, on a cost-effective basis. Again, uh, especially for these high temperatures, uh, we see that costs, uh, yes, uh, th this is not on the edge of profitability. Here we definitely need uh, higher CO2 prices uh, to, or at, at least, uh, I mean, that's always uh, the other side uh, of the coin. So to say, um, we have to decrease the technology costs in further research in order to make that profitable. In the same project, uh, we have uh, also looked, as said before, ideally you use uh, the waste heat again uh, for another company before you put it into the district heating network. And we have looked at the waste heat from a cement plant, uh, which could be used in a dairy uh, and uh, have analyzed a 0.5 kilometer transport line at a temperature of 200 degrees um, and tried to see how profitable this is. Currently, uh, it is not yet profitable, but again, on the age, edge of profitability when uh, CO2 prices or uh, yes, uh, even higher gas prices will remain and come. So uh, one thing that one could say after uh, this presentation is uh, that there are so many barriers, so many um, not yet profitable, th profitable uh, things. Um, so it will not exist, so to say, uh, but we saw in so many good practice examples also in Austria that there is uh, recovery of waste heat and also uh, an external usage of this excess heat. And so we tried uh, to analyze what uh, happened here in Austria, how many it are, and we see that there are 45 implementations of um, using uh, industrial excess heat externally, company externally, and uh, three of the cases really use uh, the heat for other industrial processes like in breweries or for drying and in 42 cases uh, the heat is used uh, for district heating purposes. What we have also seen is that excess heat is not uh, necessarily really recovered heat. Um, it uh, also comes from industrial combustion where for example um, uh, uh, gases from uh, the process or uh, wood residues are burned. And we also see that uh, it is about 7% of uh, the district heating volume sold in Austria comes from industrial waste heat, though there is always the example of Sweden uh, with uh, right above uh, 10%, uh, but we are not so bad uh, in, in, in numbers, so to say, here in Austria, with 7% uh, uh, feed in, but still definitely there is potential. What could be solutions from the district heating network side in order to have uh, the whole value chain of industrial symbiosis uh, with regard to heat? Um, on the one hand, we have a project investigating on heat transmission networks, super regional district heating networks, in other words, um, where a lot of uh, consumers and generation uh, is united uh, through this transmission network. So it should not be a uh, one directional line, but uh, something that really interconnects uh, different networks, it different uh, producers, different uh, consumers. And uh, this, as it is the case, for example, for photovoltaics, should lead to the situation that you can simply feed in because somewhere in this big grid, uh, there should be someone who can use the heat. We're still in the project. Let's see if that happens. Another thing definitely is uh, to decrease the return temperatures uh, of district heating. We see that companies are very eager to really uh, optimize the processes to avoid uh, the, the waste heat if possible, of course. 
and uh, then we have uh, waste heat temperatures of about 60 70 degrees so any uh, cascading also within the district heating network uh, would enable to better make use of uh, the available resources this is also a project currently in progress and hopefully finalized soon and one last slide on the topic of uh, feeding in industrial waste heat. In the future, uh, as also Johannes said, we see a lot of um, waste heat coming from electrolysis. About 30% of uh, the power put into the um, hydrogen making uh, will be not hopefully not lost as waste heat, but uh, available as waste heat, ideally to the local district heating network. Here, uh, industrial symbiosis depends on the site of the electrolysis. Uh, definitely, uh, when it is within the industry, it is rather the same situation as today with regard to access to district heating networks, with regard to reuse. But whenever it's an, uh, what I call an energy system electrolyzer, so to say, for storage purposes or for mobility purposes, uh, then we have low temperatures but at least allocation could be close to the district heating networks. So with these impressions, I thank you a lot for listening and uh, I'll, I am of course open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon Moser. I think we can give a virtual applause to Simon Moser. Thank you for the presentation. Any question, any short questions? I would like to ask the next speaker, Karin, Fatseni Freisel to prepare her presentation. Meanwhile, we might have um, a short question for Simon. If there's no question, maybe Simon, a, a short comment or a question to you. <clears throat> Iceland has been using um, heat in a cascading way. So the geothermal heat is extracted with almost 350 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees. <clears throat> used for electricity production, then it's used for district heating, then it's, it's also used in, in um, swimming pools, greenhouses, and for other purposes. So how, how would you see this example from Iceland that, uh, and how, where do you see potential to collaborate with Iceland? Uh, definitely there is uh, the potential uh, to collaborate on uh, how this worked out, so to say. I mean, really have to bring together all these players and uh, which is electricity generation which is uh, <clears throat> heating and uh, also the swimming pool so my voice is has passed now exactly at the right time um, and uh, learning how the symbiosis was generated is definitely uh, an interesting thing doing something thank you simon I hope that your voice that you get back your voice. You. <laughs> and we'll look forward to <laughs> and to the next presentation. So I would like to welcome Dr. Karin Fatseni Freisel. She's also a senior expert at the Energy Institute. Please, Karin, the floor is yours. I think I think you're muted. At least I can't. Sorry for that. So th thank you, David, for introducing me. Um, you're right, I'm a senior expert and a project manager at the Energy Institute at the Johannes Kepler University as my colleagues. Um, my field of expertise are life cycle assessments as well as qualitative uh, socio-technical assessments uh, for a multidisciplinary and holistic technology assessment. So today I will talk about plastics in a circular economy. And with this topic, I'm stepping away a little bit from this very energy focused presentations of my colleagues before. Um, just important to me to mention is that these plastics in a circular economy topic is an emerging topic at the Energy Institute since we were able to do several corporations in project with the JKU since 2019. Okay, so what's the content today? I give you a quick overview of the concept of circular economy, uh, and then I will uh, want to raise the question um, if recycling is a key enabler to sustainable, sustainability and uh, to the circular economy. 
As a third point, I want to show you two Austrian, current Austrian research projects we are working on to develop and evaluate novel plastic packaging recycling pathways. And um, I will close with, a, with kind of, a out, of an outlook. So the concept of circular economy developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is probably a concept you may already know. Uh, you have on the, on, the, on the left side, you have the renewable resources and on the right side, you see the man-made products uh, mainly today based on fossil resources. Circular economy, uh, to make it simple, means that we should keep materials uh, with, uh, either renewable or fossil as long as possible in a loop. So the easiest way to keep materials or products in a loop is just to reuse them. If we want to recycle them, the, the process uh, the process and the, the value chains get even more complicated. For renewable resources, um, it is especially significant to focus on a cascading resource use uh, to establish or to, to make a circular economy work. So for both in, in, in terms of plastics, I would uh, put the focus, I would like to put the focus on today on a more complex value chain on plastics recycling. So the concept of uh, circular economy has already been adopted by policymakers. Um, as an example, the European Green Deal umbrella several action plans, strategies, proposals for directives, which all aim more or less at decarbonizing the European Union and making it more sustainable. One of these action plans is the so-called Circular Economy Action Plan, which has been issued in March 2020. And this aims at make sustainable products the norm in the European Union, empower consumers and public buyers, um, for example, to make the right decisions. And what is even more interesting, the Circular Economy Action Plan already stresses out uh, some sectors where we should put the focus on as the use uh, as the use a significant amount of resources on the one hand and on the other hand the potential for circularity is high in those sectors and among those named sectors plastics is one of them further i highlighted in in green that the action plan aims at ensuring less waste and make the circular and make cir circularity work and these two points, in my point of view, um, also address can, address can be addressed by developing a better functioning recycling, plastics recycling value chain. So I do not only want to talk about uh, qualitative information, but also give you some quantitative background. On this slide, you see the recovery rates of um, plastic packaging waste in the European Union and associated countries. Um, as you can see in Austria, we already achieve a recovery rate of plastic packaging waste of approximately 100%. Thereof, most of these plastic pack recovered plastic packaging waste is used for energy purposes. On the one hand, it is incinerated in, a, in waste incineration, incineration plants with energy recovery. And on the other hand, there's a, a use of plastic packaging waste uh, in industry for energy purposes. Only so approximately 65% are used for energy recovery and only 35% are currently um, recycled in Austria of the plastic packaging. On contrast to, uh, on, in contrast to that, I thought it would be interesting for you to give you the similar, to give you the numbers for Iceland. In Iceland, the recovery rate is about um, 50% and of these 50%, um, 90, 95% of the plastic packaging waste are already recycled. So maybe you can, um, maybe you can think in the next minutes a little bit about um, why the recovery rate of plastic packaging waste is um, at 50% and tell me after the presentation, would be interesting to me. So stepping back to, to Austria, I want to give you a quick look of the plastics waste composition in Austria. 
I don't want to talk too much about the, the plastic waste comp uh, composition in detail, but I want to put you the focus on the kind of plastics making up most of the plastics waste. So polyolefins, a group of polymers, um, makes up a lot or makes up most of all the plastic packaging waste and plastic waste in Austria and, uh, and the European Union. What are polyolefins? Polyolefins are, for example, LDPE, HDPE, and PP. Um, I think you, you, um, you, have, you are confronted with one of these types of polymers every day. For example, when you buy, um, when you buy vegetables or fruits, which are packaged in, um, in plastic packaging films. These are often made from LDPE. So in Austria, we have, a, in Austria, of course, I showed you, we have a high recovery rate of plastic packaging waste is good, but the recycling rate is not so good. As you can see in the European Union countries, the recycling rates for plastic packaging waste increased over the last years. In contrast to that, they stay, stayed quite constant in Austria. So there we have um, definitely a challenge to, right, to increase our recycling rates in Austria. On this slide, I just want to give you an example that um, plastic waste is an important energy carrier in the, in the Austrian industry. Here you can see the example of the Austrian cement industry where plastic waste um, substitutes fossil energy carriers up to a significant, uh, up to a significant amount. In general, the Austrian cement industry uses approximately 80% of refused fuel derived energy carriers to substitute um, fossil energy carriers such as coal. So summing up, we can, we see that uh, this, we can see that plastic waste, this, that plastic waste also plays a, a crucial role in the Austrian cement industry where we can have, where we can potentially face a, a conflict in future if we, um, if we increase our, our recycling rates. So this already brings me to the first conclusion of, of my today's presentation. So we can, uh, we can sum up that the current EU policy strives for a significant increase of plastic recycling quotas. And there you have the current Austrian goal for 2025 we have to reach a 50% recycling rate of plastic packaging waste in 2025. Remember, currently we have 35%, so there's still a long way to go. Um, remember that plastic packaging waste is mostly made up by, by the polymer group of polyolefins, HTP, LDP, and PP. And accordingly, uh, significant amounts of plastic packaging waste are available to be fed to mechanical and chemical recycling processes. But the, the major challenge is on the one hand, mobilizing the amount currently used for, for energy recovery, which um, may need or yeah, which may need a redesign of, of um, waste logistics or value chain. In a research project we have worked on with the Institute for Polymeric Materials and Testing since, 2000, um, since, since 2019, we, um, we, did, we did several interviews and a workshop with experts of the Austrian, of the Austrian plastic sector, the Austrian uh, steel and cement industry, public authorities, etc. To figure out what are the conflict of goal, what are the goals of co conflict of goals concerning um, plastics in the circular economy, concerning plastics recycling. So I have here on this slide you can find six of the of the most important conflict of goals, and the first is the use of re recyclates versus the quality of products. So. A research question which is currently worked on is how do recyclates affect the lifespan, endurance, or function of a product? Because imagine if you buy 
if you buy a plastics product with, with a specific recycling content, it is nice to know that it's probably sourced, probably sourced more, uh, probably the material is sourced more sustainably. But um, does it also make sense if this plastics product um, only lives uh, for, for three years instead of, let's say, 10 years? So maybe you wouldn't be that happy with a recycled product if it um, does not fulfill its function. So a challenge which was, which especially occurred during um, the COVID crisis is achieving the recycling quotas versus economic feasibility and market acceptance. There, uh, I want to raise the question, what do to do with the recyclates if nobody wants to buy them? And why recycle if nobody wants the, the recyclates? So does it make sense just to recyclate um, plastics to fulfill the policy goals? And could mandatory planning targets be a solution so that we have a kind of a, a law, a EU, EU directive, which says specific products, product groups need to incorporate a specific rate of recyclates? I mentioned the, the COVID crisis. So in the, in the, for example, at the beginning of 2020, you all may know that the fossil fuel prices dropped significantly, which leads uh, to the effect that by that time, virgin plastics made from fossil, from fossil resources were much cheaper than the recycled plastics. So of course, um, nobody wanted to buy them. And some of the uh, some of the Austrian, some of the Austrian recycling companies stopped production by that time. So, of course, when we want to achieve the recycling quotas, we also uh, we also need need um, appliances for for the recyclates. So, the main research question, especially for the technicians, is where are the best appliances for recyclates? Another conflict of goals, which, ham which probably hampers establishing a circular economy is that if bio-based plastics are used, there's still a, uh, a lack of recycling value chains for those materials. So those materials um, come to the, same, to the same material stream as the fossil plastics. And accordingly, no specific recycling of the bio-based plastics is possible. And this, of course, hampers establishing a closed loop for those materials. And another question, especially for the, for the life cycle assessment specialists among us, interesting is, do bio-based plastics show an environmental advantage compared to virgin or recycled fossil materials? So the second question, Again, very interesting for LCA specialists is, does recycling make sense from an environmental point of view in any case? Um, and for any case, and each material even after 10 recycling loops. And of course, we face uh, potentially, in future we may face uh, potentially comp competing recycling value chains an example is the chemical uh, recycling route versus the mechanical recycling group. And the question will be, how can these processes be interlinked without comp competing? And of course, making the, um, the most advantage from an environmental and economic point of view out of it. So maybe you can, um, you can have, a, have still a, a quick look at, the, at these research question, maybe you'll find uh, one, the one, one and the other, which could be interesting in future for you as well. This already brings me to the two Austrian research projects, which are currently funded by the um, Austrian research uh, agency, FFG. Uh, both, both of the project started in um, 2000, yeah, to almost today, I would say. Um, and they exactly want to deal with these questions I raised before. So one, uh, one project is called Folienkreislauf 2030. Um, 
focusing on recycling options for plastic packaging films. And the Energy Institute does the work package eco-efficiency as assessment of different recycling streams, focusing on a high quality output, high volume output, and C, low reject output. One of the goals of the project for us is determining, determining the limits for material recycling and answering the questions as to when another end of life solution for plastic films is more viable than recycling from an energy and climate perspective. For example, if we need uh, several additional washing processes to make the recycling process product again feasible for blending, or if um, the, the final product will suffer from a significant decrease in lifetime uh, by an increased uh, as the material uh, degrades, um, degrades, um, yeah, if the material just degrades too much. Yeah, so we are doing an eco-efficiency assessment using ISO standard life cycle assessment methodology. Um, we will develop um, two case studies Case studies, for example, could be a coffee, pack coffee packaging or um, such a plastic film where the cucumbers are packed in and compare them with benchmark uh, solutions. And what's even more interesting than just doing the life cycle assessment is giving recommendations for designing the mechanical recycling process from an ecologic point of view. Again, I would uh, like to stress the example of the washing processes. Does another washing process make sense from an ecologic point of view? Um, can we have, um, does it add significantly to the, to the quality of the product so that the lifetime is better and the degradation of the recyclates um, is lower so that the, the trade off between technical feasibility and eco ecologic uh, advantage is optimal. The second pro uh, project is called CircPlast MR. There are also new routes for mechanical recycling of plastic packaging waste um, of, under, of currently underutilized waste streams um, is, has been started now. So again, the Energy Institute is responsible for the work package called LCA Guided Process Design and Legal Aspects. And on this uh, graph, I just give you a quick overview of the work package uh, structure and results. As you can see, we will have, um, there will be a strong interface between LCA and the process and the process design. On the one hand, we, uh, we, we are kind of, yeah, we need to get uh, data input from the process design and as an output, we can give them uh, recommendations. Um, what, what options, what design options for the process are best. Yes, so as I showed you, as I showed you the Energy Institute does um, very much in the, in the field of life cycle assessment um, for, for mechanical plastics, for new mechanical plastic recycling processes. And from an, from an currently ongoing, other ongoing research project, we have gained first evidence for the environmental impact of, of, of plastics recycling. We work usually at the Energy Institute, we work um, with the LCA software Gabi. Here you can see a standard, standard polyethylene high density granulate production process um, taken out from, from Gabi. The process um, produces one kilogram of fossil HDPE. Um, and on the next slide, I want to compare the results of such standard processes um, in LCA databases for uh, fossil virgin material production and mechanical recycling. So on this slide, you can see that in terms of global warming potential, acidification, eutrophication potential, and primary energy demand, uh, mechanical recycling of plastics show significantly advantageous compared to the fossil virgin materials. This is also, this is also what, um, what uh, is reported, what is reported in literature. You can see that 
the production step for the fossil plastics, the blue bars on the right on the right hand side is the, are the most significant um, contributors to the overall greenhouse gas emissions of the plastics value chain. Recycling, for example, at, as an end of life waste management op option um, only shows a comparably low green, comparably low greenhouse gas emissions. On this slide, kind of an other kind of another um, yeah, picture for the greenhouse gas emissions of the plastic value chain is given. You can see here that the results in literature uh, that the results in literature show a quite broad range um, and that there is as in all in every LCA that there's not the one single right answer but not the one single right answer. Um, we also have to deal with, uh, we always have to deal with, with ranges, especially here when it comes to the, to the bio-based, when it comes to the bio-based options. LCA results are always, you may know, always strongly dependent on, on assumptions, system boundaries, and so on. So we are coming to the end. Um, again, here you can see the greenhouse gas emissions made up by the plastics value chain in the European Union. Um, just to give you, give you a feeling, the, the blue section again represents the production, uh, the plastics production. And altogether, this makes up about 3% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union in the year 2017. So, we can conclude that plastics production is a significant contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions. And this again gives us an evidence that we can save uh, greenhouse gas emissions with recycling. Yeah. So conclusions and, and outlook. Um, I think I do not have to, to repeat this anymore. I just want to stress that although we have um, existing greenhouse gas assessments, existing life cycle assessments, which show, um, which, which show first results. It's always necessary to do a tailored assessment, especially if new process options are developed. Um, yeah. And finding, a, a, a finding out about the environmental benefits and pitfalls of recycling with respect to product quality is the task of the Energy Institute in the running projects in the field of plastics in a circular economy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karin, for this very nice presentation, very important presentation. I think we can give Karin a virtual applause again for her <clears throat> presentation. Thank you. And we have time for a few questions. Actually, Karin asked a question to some of the Icelandic audience. Um, why is the recycling rate lower um, around 50% in Iceland than compared to other nations. I think maybe we have a representative or someone working at Sorpa. Do we have someone in the audience who is an expert on this? Okay, we, we don't, but anyone would like to try to answer the, the question that, or the, the, the question that Karen raised during her talk? Well, maybe I can at least give my, my perception of the problematic in Iceland. In Iceland, the energy, especially heat energy, is quite cheap because there's a lot of um, geothermal energy uh, available in, in high abundancy. And so to produce, uh, to, to install incineration plants um, and recover the heat from the wet plastic waste would simply be economically probably not very efficient um, or not sustainable in Iceland. Um, I think this is one of the one of the reasons. And um, regarding the recycling rate, um, I don't know. Maybe it's a very um, the, the density is very low. So um, if you, if you're not in Reykjavik in the capital city area, um, there it's quite distributed the residential area. Maybe this might be a, a second hampering factor that you have a uh, that 
to create recycling um, systems that recover the resources, you would have to create a really widespread um, um, system. So these, these two factors are the first that I could think of when Karin raised this question. But if any Icelander would like to uh, um, comment on this or my thoughts, feel free to do so. Okay, in the meantime, I would like to ask the next speaker, Dr. Daria Markova. She's also a senior expert at the Energy Institute, and she will talk about um, hydrogen, um, green hydrogen production across Europe. Um, feel free. Uh, thank you very much. We can see your slide already. So if there are no questions for Karen, we will proceed directly with the next presentation. Any last chance to ask a question to Karen? Okay, then we will go on with the next presentation. Thank you, Karin, and the floor is yours, Daria. I think you have to, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. So just um, come back to the hydrogen. I have a short presentation about some of our ongoing projects. And um, yes, on, uh, on hydrogen production in Austria and the EU, um, Already, as David introduced me, I'm project manager and senior researcher at the um, energy technology department. I'm trying to go to the next slide, but yes, just wanted to uh, all of you to have a look on hydrogen, current hydrogen use in the EU. So, um, um, a lot of scenarios and targets uh, have been developed on how we would like to use hydrogen to future energy system. And um, I think it's very important to see where it is used now. And I have to mention that the most um, of the hydrogen is a fossil one. So it's mainly made from, um, natural gas steam reforming so and as you can see as you can see um the most hydrogen now in in you uh, is used in refining and also for ammonia production so and yes as I already told, there are different scenarios on how and where this hydrogen or also the renewable hydrogen actually will be used in the future because we see that um, it can help us the, to achieve the climate uh, targets. And um, here on this slide, I show you one study which was made in by um, fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. It is um, called study on opportunities arising from the inclusion of hydrogen energy technologies in the national energy and climate plans. So the first slide shows um, how much um, renewable um, energy should be uh, additionally installed to produce via electrolyzer um, renewable hydrogen and where it can be potentially used uh, in 2030 in the EU. There are different scenarios and uh, they had a look on the targets for renewable um, energies and so on. So we can see that um, the industry will uh, be, will need uh, a lot of uh, renewable hydrogen, hydrogen at all, and for example, uh, for the steel production, it will be also used because um, there's a need for um, decarbonizing the steel production uh, industries in, in the EU to, to the um, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, aims and targets. Um, and we can also see that the um, uh, quite a big amount of hydrogen will be used in the mobility sector and also for the buildings and also for the uh, power production. Um, just um, 
similar uh, scenarios have been made for all EU uh, countries within this study. And here for Austria, as you also have um, refineries and ammonia production facility here in Linz and also steel production. So we can see that additional hydrogen and demand will be needed in industry in 2030. And also as a thought for mobility and other sectors, it will be quite a high need of hydrogen there. So, um, Yes, and now I just wanted to um, show some projects where we as Energy Institute are involved in. And one of them is an Aeronet project called Super P2G, where different, uh, different countries have, so Italy, uh, Austria, Germany, Belgium, um, Denmark, Netherlands, uh, uh, involved and have um, different aims, but um, in regard of um, implementation of power to gas solutions, and we are trying um, to learn from each other and to exchange our results. So, um, yes, the, the, what we uh, are doing in Austria. In our sub-project, we will uh, assess the future demand of renewable hydrogen and SNG uh, for the industry, and we will have a look on economics and um, have a look how this, for example, uh, production costs of renewable hydrogen will change in the future, and also have a look which um, economic impact um, this um, enhanced use of hydrogen will give uh, for the Austrian society and the economy. Um, the next project, as I already told, that refineries are also that ones that actually use hydrogen right now. It's fossil and many of um, scenarios say, um, OK, um, we have to start. Uh, to switch to the renewable hydrogen, first of all, in the processes where hydrogen um, is used already, but it's fossil, it's more easily to achieve this uh, reduction so that you don't have to change the technologies, for example. So that's why there's also one project where we are involved, where next year um, at the refinery, the electrolysis um, will be uh, um, will be starting to produce electrolyzer will start to produce green hydrogen and it will be used for refinery and also used for mobility and um, it. Um, may uh, be very flexible in the consumption, uh, depending on how the mobility applications will uh, develop. So maybe first uh, more hydrogen will be used in the refinery. And then if there are more um, um, hydrogen trucks and buses and maybe cars, so the um, hydrogen, the green hydrogen will be used more for the mobility. The next project is H2 Pioneer. Maybe you saw on the first slide where the current demand for hydrogen was highlighted. Um, maybe so a small part of hydrogen will be used, uh, is used now for in semiconductor production um, facilities. So they need quite um, high purity of hydrogen. And um, in Austria, there's also um, some semiconductor um, conductor production uh, companies and uh, one is based in Tyrol 
um, in Villach and also next year there will be electrolyzer installed there and the screen hydrogen will be produced and directly replaced um, um, in the process um, and will be used um, there and um, the question is also that a lot of hydrogen um, comes also out uh, as a fluent gas. So the recycling of hydrogen is also very important here and uh, for the whole um, semiconductor um, industry. And there have been some um, assumptions, um, which is the most um, economically feasible technically feasible um, solution to use this hydrogen after the process. And there's also a next follow-up project, which already started, that this uh, hydrogen will be recycled and used for mobility. Uh, one more project where we are also involved, also within this energy model region, hydrogen and power to gas. Uh, it's based in the other region of Austria, where also in the next year um, electroly electrolyzer will be installed and also the um, biogas will be also used there to uh, produce methane. As you can um, see here, so we have um, electrolyzers uh, and we have biogas uh, production fac facility where we use the CO2 in the methanation reactor and we'll have different type of gases which will be used in different for different applications. So there will be uh, hydrogen and a methane and there are different um, plans to use directly hydrogen for the industry, to use it for mobility and also to inject um, methane directly in the gas net network. So, um, so there are different projects regarding the decarbonization of industry and uh, mobility. And just one last project I wanted to show you is um, about, so we have a lot of CO2 emissions um, from the industry sector in Austria. And we have one uh, local um, project, which is about uh, the production of higher hydrocarbons from CO2 from industrial processes and green hydrogen in Upper Austria, where we are based in, in Linz. And um, we have a, a look here on um, how we can, um, which uh, products we can produce by the biological processes from these affluent industrial gases. So, um, and which uh, this power to X production paths are most promising regarding the economical, ecological and social acceptance uh, aspects. <clears throat> so, um, yes, I just, also wanted to mention that all of our projects, uh, all the information on our projects, this um, short um, introduction to them and our tasks, you can find on the Energy Institute homepage. And there are also um, uh, contact information there. So you can directly write and ask um, any any questions which arise maybe after this workshop today. Yes, and just already my colleagues um, have mentioned uh, what are our main tasks uh, in the project, in the projects uh, where we are involved in. And here's the last slide about um, these research topics. 
we mainly we are mainly involved in so-called accompanying scientific research, at least in hydrogen projects, where we have developed different tools for assessment of the effects. For example, um, the tools Prestige uh, can um, analyze, uh, make techno-economical analysis of different business cases. The collect is the component level learning curve tool where you can have a look on how, for example, electrolyzer costs will reduce in the future. We have also socio-technical analysis model, which is called Samba, where the analysis of stakeholders and different um, development barriers are analyzed, and also macroeconomic analysis model. We, with the help of this MOVE uh, model, we can have a look on effects on the um, uh, Austrian economy and also life cycle assessment. And as we also have a department of um, um, low energy loss, so um, in um, some of the project also analysis of legal aspects and regulatory barriers, um, are also um, analyzed. So it's my short overview of some of the project we are involved in in this topic. If you have any questions, feel, questions, feel free to ask them now or just later. Thank you very much, Daria. I think we can give Daria a big applause, a virtual applause again. Um, if there are any questions for Daria, we have a few minutes um, to ask a question, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. Perhaps I will um, fill the gap with a small question. Um, so in Linz, we have the first Alpine um, company that is producing steel and there's a huge, um, this is probably the biggest challenge in decarbonizing the industry in, in Linz. And there are estimates that about half of the electricity of uh, domestic electricity production of Austria would be needed to produce the hydrogen to decarbonize the steel production. Um, the, what is your take on this? Do you think this is possible or what, are, what, are, what other strategies are there? Um, so, you know, maybe also, I, I haven't mentioned it there, uh, in the steel production facility, there's also um, an electrolyzer already uh, installed, uh, and there are thoughts about um, decarbonizing more uh, intensively uh, the steel production. Also, they, there's also this Borealis um, facility where the ammonia will be is produced. So there are quite a lot of like biggest industries for hydrogen production. So and um, I mean this this question about how many how much hydrogen we will need also in the future for all these industries and also the, the next question is you are absolutely right how much additional renewable energy capacities we will need uh, to operate our um, electrolyzers, it's quite a big question, and we'll try to answer it in our Super P2G project, where I just um, also mentioned today. So uh, it will be definitely challenging, and um, we have just to see how it will develop in the future. Okay, thank you very much. So there's a huge uh Neat question. There's a question. Yes. Um, okay. As somebody who is not uh, so versed in this hydrogen uh, issue, but I just read of recent that uh, Denmark is producing now directly hydrogen from wind energy. Do we have any wind plants in in Austria doing the same, or is just uh, you are still studying the possibility of using your renewables? photovoltaics and, and, and wind energy for the production of hydrogen for the electrolysis and so on. Is there something concrete already happening in this area? Uh, so in Austria, there are no wind um, um, farms um, 
using uh, using to produce hydrogen now so the, all all the hydrogen is fossil now and um, i don't know if so i haven't heard that there are any, any um thoughts about about uh, such a business plan or such a project so okay I, I will just say i just read a paper recently about Denmark doing that already mm -hmm. just something mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. so maybe i can send it to you yes definitely mm -hmm. thank you okay as we can see this is really a, a big challenge and we need young engineers that that will address this challenge as well so this is a direct message to the students listening in the in the audience that um, this is of course uh, um, it presents also a huge opportunity for the next generation to address this challenge for the next generation of engineers to address this challenge and how to decarbonize the, the industry um, so since if there's no further question i would like to go on with the next presentation Last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Egbe. Um, he is a professor uh, uh, and doctor and also a CEO of a organization in Africa. But perhaps he can introduce his background better than myself. So please, Daniel, feel free to share your slides and um, you have the microphone. Okay, I think, I hope you are seeing my, my slide, are you? Yes, we can see it, per, maybe you can press on the presentation mode. Not too much, not too much. Yeah, yeah, I have to do that. All the way to the left. Okay. So, um, as uh, David just said, um, Daniel. So, I will talk briefly present the renewable energy situation in Africa. But before doing that, you you can see that I'm in various institution. I just joined the Energy, energy Institute and the Yorka Woodlands, uh, but I'm presently sitting at the Institute of Polymeric Material and Testing of JKU. And as he said, I'm also CEO of this African network of for solar energy. I just was just appointed a uh, uh, honorary professor at the University of Rwanda. And so my talk will be, as well, I'll do a short self-presentation and then continue. And I'm from Cameroon, I'm 55 years old, I had my BSc in, in physics and chemistry at the University of Yaoundé, 91. Then I moved to Germany, where I did a diploma, a PhD, habilitation in chemistry at the University of Yale. Some stays in Master Institute for Polymer Function in Mainz, 2006, short stay, six months, then moved to uh, um, the Tenka University of Eindhoven for one year. Then from there to TU Chemnitz, and from Chemnitz, um, I landed in, in JKU since 2009. I spent um, a good time at the Linz Institute for Organic Solar Cells because myself, I am, um, my research field is the design of materials for optoelectronic applications and for uh, uh, energy applications. Okay. So, and then uh, since 2016, October 2016, I moved to the Institute of Polymeric Material Testing, where I've been working with uh, Professor Lang. Uh, and we decided since I came here, or I came to his institute, we've been having a strong focus on Africa in different aspects. And this focus of Africa made me come also at the Energy Institute where the topic of my project there will be, I will present it at another time, more, more or less within the, um, the seminar group meeting of, of, of the Energy Institute, where the focus will be how to um, use or produce um, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen from North Africa, 
for the European uh, uh, market and also for, uh, for the recycling of, uh, of, 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 rec recycling of, of plastics. So as I said, since November 2000, 1st of November 2001, I've been appointed honorary professor in chemistry at the University of Rwanda, which is a very, um, as uh, this, as he said, I'm very involved in many things, not only uh, CEO of ANSO, but I've created a lot of, uh, of, uh, of institutions as independent evaluator for the World Bank and, and many institutions. I am, yeah, so I'm somebody who, I like cooking, and I dance, like dancing salsa. So if you, the ladies say who can dance salsa, you can contact me, we can have a row. But the, the, um, the, the lockdown doesn't allow any form of dancing. Okay. My uh, research here, as I said, is uh, organic semiconducting material, finding applications in uh, organic light emitting diodes, photovoltaics, transistors. I hope, yeah, just for you to have a view about me. Let me come uh, straight to what we are going to sp speak today about renewable energy situation in Africa. And when we talk about renewables, I just, for those, the students who are following, you just repeat, more you repeat, the more you, 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 you keep in your mind. Uh, the renewables are hydropower, geothermal energy, solar energy, and in solar energy, we have the solar thermics, and the photovoltaic, we have ocean tides, and um, wind energy, and bio energy. Uh, I will just uh, say here, um, and if you go to photovoltaic, you have the first, second, and third generation, and my research field was, has been in the third generation, the organic uh, solar cells, and uh, so those who know Professor Isaiah Sichid, um, they know is one of the guru in the field, and that's that what made me to come to to Linz, actually. Um, if we talk about the renewables, um, Africa, when and we focus of, on Africa, we'll, we can talk, focus mainly on hydropower, geot uh, geothermal energy, solar energy, uh, wind energy, and biomass. So, uh, ocean tide is not known as such. There's no uh, research going on, or there's, there's nothing in, in this field. Although there is a lot which can be done there, when you, when you see uh, South Africa could, could go into it, and most of the coastal uh, country could, could use uh, ocean tide to produce uh, energy. Uh, the energy situation in Cameroon, this slide gives you, this is a slide from the African Union Commission, which shows you non-renewable energy types and, and renewable energy types which are found in Africa. I can say Africa has abundant energy sources, and that's why, um, okay, I don't want to go to strong geopolitics, and that's why the West, the global North, uh, wants to keep Africa where it is, not develop, but to make Africa just uh, the, the supplier of everything, or when it, of natural resources, or whether they are uh, of, um, energy type or, or other type. So uh, you can see um, for the non-renewable energy, we have crude oil, the, the, the millions of barrels which can be produced and, uh, and so on. Then you come to the renewables, um, we have the hydropower and uh, the amount which can be um, produced per year, the biomass and solar and wind, um, which are the, the main, I can say the main, uh, the geothermals. Uh, are there also, but it's not showing here. Um, I will just go straight for the different type. The geothermal energy is mostly found in East Africa, yeah, uh, more concentrated in East Africa. Um, the, the, the main countries are Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, as you can, you can see here. Um, so the development of, of it, it's, uh, okay, uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's just localized in that, in that area. Um, in other parts of Africa, nothing is done. And so research in this area is mainly uh, in those uh, countries that I mentioned, especially Kenya is doing a lot uh, of research in, in geothermal uh, energy. Um, biomass is the most used energy. Okay, first of all, when it comes to biomass, Africa has 25% of the global biomass reserve. And I want to say around 80% of sub-Saharan African depend on biomass for cooking with very low uh, energy efficiency in heat conversion of traditional coal uh, stoves. So the heat conversion is around 10 to 15%. Uh, but this has serious impact on health and mortality, affecting mostly women and children. So um, biomass is the main energy source 
for, for many people in, in sub-Saharan Africa. As I said, it has, uh, through the production of, of uh, toxic gases, um, many women die and children, uh, nursing children who are with their mothers uh, can easily lose their life because of, uh, of the use of, of, of this traditional stove, like most than the three stone uh, um, stove, uh, yeah. And if and the, the problem is that biomass is renewable only when you replant. Uh, and, 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 and if you go to uh, East Africa, not only East Africa now, I can always say West Africa, what is happening, people are cutting trees for, for, for energy uh, source, but they are not replanting. And the case of, I'll give an example, Zambia, in the case of Zambia, um, an area similar to uh, Zaland in Germany is um, deforested every year just for, for wood production. So, and for that, women have to walk distances to get, uh, get wood. And 2018, there was a big debate in Kenya because of, of this uh, issue. Because uh, one found that the cutting of trees, especially in East Africa, what they do, they cut the trees and produce charcoal. It is burned, first of all, to produce charcoal. And this charcoal is used for cooking. That's what you, you find mostly in East Africa. But in, in, in other parts of Africa, the wood is used directly in the traditional uh, stove. So uh, there was a big debate in 2018, around uh, the beginning of 2018 in, in Kenya, how to uh, mitigate uh, this problem. So uh, um, the decision to do replanting of trees uh, was uh, uh, traumatized in, 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 in Kenya. I hope uh, this has followed some action in, in, in this area because uh, if this high consumption of, of biomass is not uh, uh, replenish means replaced by plant of trees. Uh, the the desertification process in Africa will continue, and uh, which uh, one has to do something against. So there are some solutions. Um, uh, as I said, the high consumption of non-renewable palm and leaves to advancement of the desert, soil erosion, temp temperature increase. We know that trees um, play a big role not only to for um, thermal comfort, so those where there are trees, uh, people can sit under the tree, and the, a tree can reduce the, 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 the ambient temperature to down to three degrees. So uh, trees play a, a big role. That's why on the, the left, left side of my slide, you can read this uh, saying: if the tree bothers you, if the heat bothers you, plant a tree. If the water bothers bothers you, plant a tree. If the fruits, uh, if you like fruits plant a tree, if you like birds, plant a tree, and if you like life, plant many trees, please plant trees. So it's a, it's a call for all of us, especially for Africa, because as I said, there is a high consumption of biomass. Also, um, make biomass solution, make biomass renewable by replanting trees. That's what I'm, yeah. And we know that during the COP26, 110 counties pledged to end their deforestation by 2030, which makes us, I'm very happy about this, uh, this uh, decision of COP26, because something must be done, uh, especially in Africa. Yeah. And so other solutions are the use of solar cookers or use of food saving stoves. And when it comes to solar cooker, uh, in the 90s, uh, some, some groups tried to introduce uh, solar cooker. Uh, okay, before going to solar cooker, I, I will just I will, uh, give you something which we, have, uh, we are trying to do. Um, I'm seeing on this slide that involve, uh, involvement of uh, African religious entities in issues pertaining to sustainability, environmental protection, climate uh, goals, uh, energy transition is very important. Um, when you come to Africa, everybody goes to church or, uh, or it's uh, Friday, go, go, goes to a mosque. So the, the religious leader has a very, uh, they have a big say in what is happening. So I, I believe um, if we want to meet, we want to address issues concerning sustainability or environmental protection and all these SDGs, it is good to pass through uh, churches or mosques. And that's what the, the King of Morocco did uh, to implement or to raise awareness about uh, photovoltaics or, or in his country. So he decided to, um, to install on 600 mosques uh, photovoltaics and so and imams were called to 
to talk about uh, renewables uh, for, to the population so that the population should, should, should know about or learn about uh, this issue. So what, uh, what we, are, we are trying to do in the case of AMSOL, uh, AMSOL is the African Network for Solar Energy, the network that I'm, 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 I'm leading and this network uh, fosters um, training, uh, education and, and research on renewable energy in, in Africa. We are presently in 45 African countries and, um, and 30 non-African countries. We are already 10 years old. And so with more than uh, um, 1,000 members, most of them from the academia. So Ansol um, has, I'm giving you two examples that where Ansol is uh, uh, implicated when it comes to um, environmental protection or awareness raising on, on renewable energy. We have signed a, a contract with uh, one CO2 compensation firm in, in, in Germany, because that's where Ansol is based as, as, as NGO, touring an institution like Hattish Kajet and Klima Schutz. Um, and they will collect funding. And this funding will help us train pastors and laymen and women of the Anglican Church in Rwanda on installation and maintenance of PV system. So, and the, the idea is those, those train will be trainers for, tr uh, they will train others. So, yeah, yeah. And the other very important thing, which I'm, I'm happy is that, um, and so we'll be signing, I'll be signing an, a cooperation agreement with uh, the Union de, des Églises Baptistes de Cameroon, uh, which is uh, uh, in the French speaking part of Cameroon. Cameroon has to, uh, two parts, English-speaking part and French-speaking part, and this uh, Union des Églises Baptistes de Cameroon have, have, uh, have contacted us, and, and they are seeing the, necess uh, the necessity of working with us when it comes to planting of trees in North Cameroon. North, North Cameroon has a more or less Sahel uh, feature, and the advancement of the desert is making especially women to suffer. Most women have to to, to walk two hours to look for water, just having, and the water that they, they fetch is uh, very, very dirty. So, and it's because of, 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 of uh, the abandonment of the desert. So we said uh, the church together with Ansol should do something. And uh, we are going to, go to sign this uh, cooperation agreement and we start working on uh, planting of trees in, in northern part of, of Cameroon. And we believe uh, this concept can be replicated in many uh, African uh, countries, like working together with uh, uh, religious uh, entities. So solar cookers, I said, was, was introduced, uh, yeah, in, especially in West, in West Africa uh, in the 90s, but people were very reluctant to accept this, uh, uh, this technology, which is uh, uh, CO2 free actually. Um, why? Because uh, uh, of the, the, the way people live, their, their, their living conditions. Most of the people go to, go to farms during the day and, and women will come back from, from their farm and right to cook in the evening and there's no sun. So, um, uh, but at, at the same time, with time, the, the, uh, the technology is accepted bit by bit. Uh, yeah, and uh, I attended a series of solar cooker conferences in, in, in Germany, in Alerting, and also in, in Portugal, and where you have uh, different forms of solar cooker combined with um, uh, uh, um, other technologies where you can cook during the day and preserve it for the evening through uh, some uh, heating baskets and, 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 and so on. So this guy on the left, uh, is from Celestino from uh, from uh, Portugal. He's a passionate uh, solar cooker uh, professor. So he does everything. And it, at, at his home in, in in southern Portugal, he cooks only with solar cooker and the, the type that he has on in his hand. So um, these uh, these are technologies which can help decarbonize. Uh, yeah, the the let me say the, the energy uh, sector. So we uh, how. I'm showing you this slide of uh, one organization um, uh, from Switzerland, Association Pour le Développement de l'Energie Solaire. Uh, uh, they are successful story in, in Madagascar. So what they did was to, to do strong um, information dissemination using TV, radio, and cartoons 
in the local in the local language and especially to train women um, uh, on uh, uh, on uh, solar cookers and wood saving stove. So they, they have 11 center of, uh, centers of training in, 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 in Madagascar and they succeeded to, to reach more than 100 households uh, and convince more than 100,000 uh, 100, uh, households in the use of uh, solar cookers uh, and, and this uh, um, uh, low carbon, uh, uh, low CO2 emission uh, te technology. So, so uh, this concept can also be replicated in other part of uh, Africa where there is some reluctance in the use of, 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 of solar cooker. But we also within our, the Ansol educate, public education mission, solar cookers are not only meant for, for Africa, but it is also possible, especially uh, in, in Europe, also here in Austria, we, we, uh, we could, um, we, uh, with Saint German Begeistern, uh, we could make children to be too uh, enthusiastic by presenting this uh, solar cooker that was in, 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 in September 2014 in, in Trieste. And the children could see how you could cook eggs and bake cake and do many things with uh, solar cookers. And uh, the same thing I did in, in West in West Lake Britain in, in um, uh, during the UNESCO World Science Day. Uh, so, so when it comes to um, uh, wind, wind energy, uh, uh, we'll find uh, wind energy makes 20% uh, of, of, of global energy. Uh, in the case of Africa, it is more concentrated in, um, in North Africa and in Southern Africa, in Southern part of Africa. So uh, South Africa um, has some wind plants and uh, the North, North African countries have some, but it can still, be developed more uh, in, in this, this part, two, two parts. And some also, you can see from the map, also Eastern part of Africa, like Eritrea, can also uh, develop some, some, some wind energy, uh, wind, uh, tap from wind, wind energy. Um, so this slide just gives you, uh, uh, especially for Southern Africa, the, um, the potential of, of wind speed. So if you take the case, I'll just give you the two main countries where wind energy is mostly developed. Like, uh, in North Africa, Morocco, which has more than um, 10 meters per second wind speed, and South Africa, you find between uh, let me say 7 and 10 meters uh, per second wind speed. Um, the hydropower, uh, hydro energy um, potential is also there. So uh, um, as you can see here, production uh, potential of one, one of uh, and, and 1,440 terawatt hour per year is given. And African Union wants to uh, um, develop this uh, big dam in Congo where a lot of energy can be produced to, to supply energy in Southern Africa and other part of, 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 of Africa and also Central Africa. So this is a big project of the African Union, especially within what they are calling the, the agenda, to, um, agenda 2063. Okay, we have the new deal, the, the Green Deal for Europe, um, and but Africa has its own uh, agenda also, which is the Agenda 2063, and it is called the Africa We Want, with seven aspirations. And one, is, one of the, the main aspirations is to, to provide um, energy, and, and especially renewable energy, to meet the energy need of, 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 of Africa, and hydro energy will play a big Role, but I want to say that this uh, hydro energy is bringing some some instability in some parts of Africa. If we take the case of Ethiopia, which has is building a very big dam uh, using the, the, the River Nile, and this is causing instability within the country. And and from what I'm getting, um, uh, Egypt is against the the dam, and and Egypt is influencing some separatist movement within uh, uh, the Ethiopian, yeah, within Ethiopia, especially the Romo uh, group. The Romos are the biggest, let me see, the, the majority of people within Ethiopia. And they have also a strong uh, Muslim uh, group within. So uh, um, yeah, 
these are issues which are destabilizing Africa. Africa, I would say, there is a lot of geopolitics going on in Africa. So that most time, one asks the question, why is Africa not advancing? And uh, you, you, and if if you know in depth what is going on behind the scene, you understand why. Uh, things are not moving easily. I will not, we, we should not put, put the blame on this on geopolitics and, and neocolonialism. The Africans have their own blame also. But what we've noticed, as somebody who is uh, come from Africa, is that whenever Africa wants to advance, uh, you will find suddenly a war somewhere, a disease somewhere, uh, bringing instability for, for the continent. So it is very difficult for the African continent to, to plan things at, at the long term. So this is my uh, opinion. Um, solar energy, um, here we have the, the world solar energy map, so you can see how Africa is blessed with the sun, and, and it, yeah, um, solar technologies, uh, I just wrote some uh, uh, below, silicon technology adaptive to specific African environment, so for, for, for Africa, we need technologies who are adaptable for, for the uh, environment, and, uh, and I've just cited some of uh, uh, them there. Um, uh, 74% of the continent receive more than uh, 1,100 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. So Africa is uh, really blessed uh, with the sun um, and uh, we have to use uh, the solar energy actually. But there are some issues uh, uh, pertaining to, which, which are really hindering the implementation of, 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 uh, of solar, ener solar energy. We have um, environmental and climatic condition High temperature, not only on uh, all the solar panels uh, can uh, work under high temperature. We have long rainy seasons, we have dust, especially this dust issue. When you go to Tanzania, I've been to Tanzania through the, the network, I've been traveling to many African countries. Uh, the roofs are covered with dust within few seconds. So if you have a solar, you have you have high uh, radiation, but you um, uh, installing solar panels would mean that you, you need to be cleaning constantly the, 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 the solar panel, which, will, which is uh, um, energy, uh, okay, uh, water and, and, and manpower uh, um, consumption, let me put it this way. So, and you have the social uh, behavior, which can play a role and the opportunity. Power. Not many people have enough more money to, to purchase uh, uh, solar uh, photovoltaics. Uh, although in, in countries like uh, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, and also Senegal, uh, there are some models of, 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 of providing photovoltaic renewable energy to, to the population. People uh, install and uh, through smart system, they can pay, they can pay uh, monthly, just like electricity bill, and, and pay very small amount. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, um, according to one PhD, uh, which I also, I was a PhD from University of Santiago de Compostela, I, I was one of the evaluators of this PhD, where I learned a lot from it. So this uh, lady, uh, Christina Cabo Landaira, she, 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 she did a, a PV system design optimization of function automatic uh, con uh, condition. That was her PhD topic. So she, she studied um, different, uh, PV system and in different areas uh, globally, what he found was, uh, and which is good for Africa, that polycrystalline silicon uh, solar cell can be used on at all climatic condition and um, and which is uh, I, I can say good news. Uh, but I want to say that uh, the the PV system which are uh, are coming to Africa, the the quality is not the same as the one uh, coming to Europe. Most of the PV system are coming from China. I want to put it this way. China is the world, is, uh, uh, is the world producer for, for, for almost all the nations. Uh, Germany was uh, at the beginning leading in, in producing, but most of the German companies decided to move to China or, uh, and now China is leading. So, and, um, and so, so what the Chinese do, the, the products coming to Europe are high quality and uh, the low quality as are sent to Africa. So you can even buy a solar panel in a normal grocery in, 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 in Burkina Faso and, and many in 
although in Kenya or Cameroon, so which, which are low quality of uh, solar panel. That's a, a big issue. Why? Uh, I can say most of those African country do not have a, 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 a norm uh, institute, uh, institute for, 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 for standardization, uh, which should be there like TÜV in Germany. We, bef before solar panels go to Germany, uh, there's, there's TÜV in, uh, in, in Shanghai controlling the panels before they're, they're, they're shipped to, to Germany. But such things not happen in many African countries. So the low quality products come. And uh, so people who use those low quality products are disappointed and then we'll say uh, photovoltaics is not a, a good solution for, for their energy uh, uh, problem yeah, because of this low quality. So uh, I was talking about uh, affordable and adaptable uh, uh, technologies. Some young people, uh, this was a joint venture between China and, and Kenya where um, a, a, a flexible, uh, adaptable, Photovoltaic was uh, was was designed for corrugated roof uh, because many houses in in Africa have this corrugated roof, and this is a, a technology which you can adapt. If the, the, the good thing is that you can uh, um, mount it yourself, and you can keep it fixed by nailing. Uh, because uh, the, the the thing is that if you have a normal photo solar panel. Somebody can steal, it can be stolen <laughs> by, by Nigeria if it's not well uh, installed and so on. So they can, they, uh, these guys uh, brought up this idea of making such a, a adaptable technology for, for, for the roof system, in, for most of the roof in, in, in Africa. But uh, solar energy can also be used, and, and these are ideas that I'm bringing for Africa. Um, for uh, for uh, the product for the production for in the in industrial production, uh, like for instance breweries. You, in in Germany we have this um, solar beer level, where uh, some presently more than thirty breweries in Germany and surrounding countries, Switzerland and some some we have some also here in in Austria, where they have the level of solar beer or the uh, solar food and, and yeah. Um, this level is given uh, after a, a thorough uh, um, examination of your, your plant and if you are meeting all the um, renewable uh, 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 requirements and, and, and so on. And this guy was the one who uh, started the idea, is uh, uh, from, from Bavaria. And, um, but uh, the first uh, solar, let me say solar brewery, is in Talmansfeld, in, not fast, very far from, from um, uh, Nuremberg. And uh, they, use, they use photovoltaics and, 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 and wood and biomass in, for, the, um, for, for, the, for the energy. And actually the excess energy, as somebody was, was saying, goes into the so-called, what you were talking of, district net. So they supply the ex excess of energy it supplies 70 houses uh, for that small, it's a small village actually. Um, and uh, um, they had to won so many prizes. The first guy who did it, this is uh, uh, here. And I have, I don't know if you are watching, I have also this solar beer. Let me put my, okay. I did not put on my, my mic, my, my this thing. If I put it on, you can see the solar beer. Uh, okay, so I have such a solar beer here, um, and the solar the the production of such a. Let's see if it goes on the next slide. Ah. My machine has got stopped. Ah, yeah. So the production of. Um, of such a solar beer um, produce only two gram uh, of CO2, and only two gram of CO2 are emitted. Um, uh, but the normal production using the conventional uh, method, you produce 73 uh, grams. So you uh, more than almost 98% uh, vinegar, uh, less um, CO2 or, or yeah, um, as it's written there. Uh, so this concept 
is, uh, has been spread to different uh, uh, type of, of, of uh, foods, uh, you have solar coffee, solar water, and so on. And the, 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 I'm bringing it here to say that this same thing uh, can be replicated in Africa. Africa has a lot of en uh, solar energy. We have, uh, the replication in Africa is possible through the abundance of the sun, the biomass can be certainly made available, um, adaptation of the, the strict German licensing process. Um, the personnel can be trained in Germany, joint venture between Europeans and, and, and Africans can, can be done. The, the use of local raw materials like cassava in the production of beer, oranges and other fruits in the production of soft drinks, income generation for farmers. So uh, this is something which um, can be replicated in, in, uh, in, in Africa where we have a high percentage of, of jobless people. So if we are doing the energy transition, one has to think of ways of using this energy uh, to, to, for, the, the, for the job market, to create jobs. And, and such a, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just showing uh, the case where uh, the local materials, local food stuff like cassava, which is a, a staple food stuff in, in many parts, especially in, in Central and West, uh, West Africa with cassava, uh, many type of uh, derivatives are, are uh, produce uh, for, 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 for food. So, uh, but it can be used also for, for beer, beer, beer uh, production. And you, you have, uh, you have this, um, this an example, white bull lager produce uh, using uh, cassava instead of using wheat. So uh, the combination of solar and or renewable energy or solar energy in particularly and biomass and uh, will create uh, jobs in, in Africa uh, with uh, local uh, um, uh, materials. So I will just end up by saying that uh, God has blessed uh, us with the sun. This is what the special did in, uh, after we created and so I went to India and the Hindu uh, published this uh, journal. I will end up uh, by, by making this uh, statement due to its non-encrusted level of de uh, development. I mean, non-encrusted means Africa is still in, in, uh, in quote, uh, virgin when it comes to, as compared to, to Europe. Um, uh, yeah, so there are, and it can embark in the energy transition easily as compared to other parts of the world. So due to non-encrusted level of development and its abundant renewable energy uh, resources, Africa had the potential and flexibility to play a leading role in the energy trans, uh, transition if the following measures are taken. I say one, real independence and political stability in the continent. We have to stop geopolitics and neocolonialism, which are always coming in to destabilize uh, the, 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 the continent. An African government should invest in research and development by allocating its at least the pledge one percent of the GDP. I want to say uh, most of the, most uh, the, the big problem with Af uh, the research in Africa is lack of funding. A survey was made some few years ago where researchers in Africa were asked, "What is your your greatest hindrance for you to carry, carry out uh, good research?" The first was uh, lack of uh, funding. Second was lack of uh, adequate equipment, and and so on. So. Uh, uh, if, if we put in perspective worldwide, um, Africa has a population of, 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 uh, of uh, one point, uh, I can say around 1.1 or 1.2 billion. I cannot give exactly the number because uh, no clear sense has been made in the, the whole of the continent. So, but we just estimate that way. So around 13% of the world population is in Africa. But, the, the production of, of publication is extremely low. Um, it's uh, also around one point something percent uh, of the worldwide uh, publications. So, and why? Because most of the African institutions are not well, they're not well equipped or uh, and they are not funded for, for, for research. But if you take the Africans in the diaspora, you take uh, in the case of France, uh, there are a lot of Africans from, from, from North Africa and Sub-Saharan sub Africa, especially coming from French-speaking Africa. They are producing almost 50% uh, of the French, among other foreigners. But 
they are producing uh, almost 50 percent of the publication in, in in France or contributing in the publication in France uh, uh, whereas in the continent nothing is uh, is moving because of lack of funding and many uh, research uh, funding are coming from donors from Europe or, or, uh, or North, uh, North America, uh, but he will give the funding dictates what you, you research on. So for Africans to research on topics uh, which will solve their problem, their government should put in funding uh, in, 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 in research and development. And, and the African government pledged 1% of their GDP uh, for, for uh, R&D, but uh, they are, this uh, pledge has not been materialized. That's uh, and another, the, the last point which I'm saying that Africans should start trusting themselves and be ready to do mistakes. So um, there is, I don't know, it comes from maybe the, the colonial past that Africans don't trust themselves. They, they will train some engineers, but they don't trust their engineers. They prefer to bring Chinese or some people from other parts of the world. So I said, Africa should be ready to do mistakes by doing themselves. Uh, you do mistake and you learn from your mistakes. So and and go from theory to practice. And for that, as I said, funding is needed. Um, and we are in a pandemic situation. Uh, uh, re regionalism should be should be fostered. So as I said, these measures these are necessary step to foster re regionalism, uh, which regionalism helps also to reduce the uh, the emission of CO two. Uh, if, if uh, instead of sheep moving from China to Africa and, and moving uh, where a lot of CO2 is emitted, if uh, the regional industry uh, is developed, so you have less uh, transportation and less emission of CO2. Um, and I think uh, uh, these steps will also contribute in mitigating the, the climate dilemma. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Daniel for this very important talk and very interesting talk about Africa. I think we can give Daniel a big applause, a virtual applause. And if there are any questions um, for Daniel or any other speakers, feel free to do so now. Anyone with a question for um, sustainable energy development in Africa? So maybe a, a question to the audience. Is there anyone from the United Nations Geothermal Training Program in the, in, the, in the audience? I saw a hand coming up, Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, feel free, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, no, uh, I thought you were asking if somebody came from uh, UNUGTP. Yes, exactly. The great. So we have, I think we have two students from the United Nations Geothermal Training Program, Daniel, and this is what I have been discussing with you. And um, this is actually a program. Um, it's financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Iceland, where um, 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 students, fellow students are um, they are paid to come to Iceland to get a training in geothermal energy and then go back to, um, to export the knowledge on geothermal energy. So uh, maybe this could be a way of collaborating with and building up the capacities in, our, in the developing countries. Does anyone want to comment on the program and the experience they had? Uh, hello, David. So uh, before it was a UNU GTP, but uh, since 2020, it now changed to Grow GTP, which is under UNESCO. Yes. Then we also have here Damaris Njorge from Kenya, from Africa. Maybe Damaris, you could share something. Hello. So. Hello. So Damaris can give share us about the geothermal energy situation in uh, in in Kenya. She, 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 I think she has more more knowledge. Hello, can you? Uh, Damaris, we can hear you, but uh, it's a little bit low volume. And now. 
that more clear. Thank you, Damaris. Okay. I, so yes, I'm from Kenya and we have actually developed geothermal in Kenya. And from the presentation, it's uh, especially from Daniel, uh, he has highlighted a lot uh, about Africa and the opportunities that we have. Uh, I'm also very interested in the solar that he's talked about. Uh, in Kenya, we have done uh, almost 700 megawatts in geothermal and uh, right now we're trying to drill for other countries, especially um, in Ethiopia and Djibouti. And um, there are very many prospects and um, activities that uh, are available for collaboration, especially in all those fronts, including wind and solar and also geothermal. So maybe a follow-up question, Jeffrey. You mentioned that the program changed. Um, so now it's under the umbrella of UNESCO. Can you um, shortly outline what changed? Did anything of the content change, is, or is, is it just the framework that changed? Uh, I do believe that it's just the framework that changed because from before it's from the United Nations, but now it's on. It's now under the umbrella of the uh, UNESCO, but okay. the program is still the same. It's a six months program. And uh, most of the invited are from Asia and Africa. So for, from, from Africa, we have Djibouti, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, uh, and the other African countries. I don't remember everything. But uh, the program is still the same. It's still six months, usually conducted during summer. Yeah. Do you okay. want to add anything? Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Philippines. OK, from Philippines. OK, okay thank you very much. Um, so if there are any questions for one of the presenters, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. So if there are no questions, then I would just like to um, thank the presenters again. Uh, thank you very much for participating. And again, um, <clears throat> there's the, the Reykjavik University has this collaboration with the Energy Institute. So there is the possibility to actually get a Erasmus grant <clears throat> and um, collaborate with the experts from the Energy Institute. So if you're interested in this, feel free also to get direct in contact with the invited speakers. Um, you can find emails um, on the on the website of the Energy Institute, or I, I can of course also make the contact possible with you um, for you. <clears throat> so, if there are any questions, feel free to ask now. Otherwise, we would close today's seminar. Any questions? Okay, in this case, it's a little bit past 12 o'clock already. So the, the, our, our friends from Austria, they will probably have to are already hungry and would like to go for lunch. And in Iceland, it's a, a bit before lunch. So you have time to get ready for lunch. So I would like to thank everybody for joining in and look forward to meeting you tomorrow morning again for the second part of this sustainable energy seminar. Thank you very much for joining. Have a nice day. Thank you.